All right, so here we are starting on Chapter 6, The Constitution and New Republic. Uh, this is going to primarily focus on uh, really a lot of concepts and things that you should have gotten last year in uh, AP government. So a lot of this will be really just review, but a little bit more from the historical aspect of um, writing the Constitution and how we got to that point and how we established the system of government that exists today uh, in the United States. It's important to note, uh, the United States of America, since its founding in 1776, has had two separate governments, uh, the Articles of Confederation and uh, the government of the Constitution, which has been around, uh, obviously, since 1791. So here we are then in 1787, and um, getting ready then to establish this new system, um, hoping to establish this new system because it's clear that the Artists Confederation just don't work. All right, so how do we come up with, set up, or frame the new government? The Founding Fathers are referred to as both uh, the Founding Fathers of our country and also the Framers because it's a lot of the same people that are the Framers of the Constitution. All right, so... In 1787, what's going on? Here we are, 1787. It's always important to be aware of the timeline. Uh, we've just had Shays' Rebellion. It's just become apparent that the Arrows of Confederation just is not going to work at handling certain crises. And, um, you know, an example uh, would be with, with what happened with Shays' Rebellion or some of the other conflicts that existed with Native Americans. We need a stronger national executive to... Um, kind of manage uh, some of the problems that uh, that exist uh, in in the country as we're we're recognizing under the Articles, right? So, and essentially that's because the Articles of Confederation are pretty weak. Uh, the the central or the national government of the Articles, as we already know, um, is very inconsequential, has very few powers. Um, and there's no kind of strong um, national commercial policy that exists. There's no real way to raise funds. There's no way to uh, tax. There's no way to um, put an army together, even though it's the job of the federal government to handle war. So there's all these things about the Articles that the Founding Fathers, when they created the Articles of Confederation, kind of overlooked. And one thing that's really important here is a lot of the people that were part of creating the Articles of Confederation are also going to be a part of creating the new government. And what that means is you're able to, as I've been saying all semester, you can keep the stuff you like and get rid of the stuff you don't and kind of bring everything together. And you have experienced people that are committed to and buy into what America is supposed to be all about. So the fact that we're able just to dump this Articles of Confederation government and create a new system, um, you know, uh, our new system under the Constitution um, is, is really aided by the fact that there's so many of the same people that are part of this whole thing, okay? But now you have a problem. Now you have a problem. So the states, uh, of course, as they are today, are of varied sizes uh, and therefore varied interests. So the states, the representatives, the delegates from each state want to be sure to um, uh, be sure to make sure that their uh, their state needs are being recognized, um, and they're not going to be overpowered simply by um, <clears throat> uh, simply by uh, you know the larger states. So let's get into that a little bit because you have kind of two competing ideals here. You have the Virginia plan, uh, which is also called the, the big states plan, the big states plan. So the Virginia plan, which is the big states plan. And the Virginia plan, um, and this is important, right, suggests two houses of government, okay? Um, so they want a two house system. Two houses. And members of the um, upper house will be elected by members of the, or will be chosen by members of the lower house. In other words, if we put that in today, uh, you'd have uh, the House of Representatives uh, would pick the members of Senate from 
their state. So they want this two house system, which is kind of similar to uh, what had existed in Virginia in colonial times, the House of Burgesses. You know, with a couple important tweets, uh, tweaks. Um, so you have the, the big states plan. They want two houses, um, one where the members of the upper house are selected by members of the lower house. This is favorable to the big states. Then you also have the small states plan, which is called the small states plan and also referred to as the New Jersey plan. Same thing. It's important to know both just in case you see a question that references one or the other. So the small states uh, simply want one house, keep things the way they are more with one house with equal representation, uh, but they want to establish a stronger, more centralized system of taxation and commerce. Okay, a stronger, more centralized national system of taxation and commerce stronger, more centralized national system of taxation and commerce. Remember, uh, these were weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. No power to tax, no power to handle trade, which is another word for commerce. So that's a big uh, you know, issue uh, that they want to deal with. So that's the plan that they're kind of proposing. Okay, So you have two competing sides, both with good ideas. What happens uh, when you put it all together uh, is ultimately going to be something known as the Great Compromise. And the Great Compromise is ultimately how we end up with what we have today, where you have an upper house, the Senate, that will have equal representation for each state, and a lower house, the House of Representatives, that will be based on population. Okay, Upper house, two from each state, equal representation. Lower house, based on population, and it'll be varied numbers of representatives. So basically, they took the things they liked from both of these suggestions and came up with something called the Great Compromise. Again, as always with the Compromise, nobody is, is totally satisfied, but it's a step in the right direction and something that, that uh, the framers, that these people can live with. So that's what's important about the Great Compromise. That's a big deal. What makes this country work early on is because we have great people that are willing to work together to come up with a solution. OK, and you get all these folks here, all the framers, all the founding fathers, you put them together in a room and they say, we want A, B and C. And the other group guys say, we want, we want D, E and F. And you find a way to maybe give them A, B, E and F. Right. So everybody gets a little bit of what they want. Everybody can be happy. Nobody gets everything that they want. But it's a system that, that people hope is, is, is going to work. Um, and is going to, you know, help make this country uh, able to survive. So they come up with a system um, with equal representation, as well as the upper house that has two uh, representatives. Okay, uh, so Senate and House of Representatives that is now created. So that's how we framed and created our new government through the great talents and skills of the founding fathers of the framers. Next comes the creation of the Constitution. So in order to create the Constitution, there's other co uh, compromises that have to be made. As we said before, compromises are risky because nobody gets exactly what they want. So what are the uh, two, co two big other compromises that have to be made in order to get a Constitution to happen? One of these is something known as the three-fifths compromise. Okay, so... One of the big issues, of course, in the colonies, a growing issue, is slavery. The North isn't so dependent on it. The South is very dependent on it. Southerners are starting to become concerned about the future existence of slavery. More and more Northerners are calling for slavery to end. Okay, so we start to see that happen a little bit. Um, and that's where the Three-Fifths Compromise comes from. What the Three-Fifths Compromise basically states is that... Um, Every slave that somebody owns would count for count towards three fifths uh, of one person in that state's population. Okay, so that means if you own five slaves, it actually counts as three people towards the state population because at the height of slavery, um, slaves were about forty to forty-five percent of the population in the South, and the South, rightfully so, is afraid that. Um, you know, if, if the push for an end of slavery continues to grow, 
we're going to have um, <clears throat> uh, if so if the push for slavery continues to grow uh, the basically the the more powerful northern states are going to vote slavery out of the south okay and, and of course they're economically they don't want it so three-fifths compromise three-fifths compromises um, protects slavery uh, for the future um, and uh, allows for it to continue and gives the southern states more representation in Congress because of that three-fifths. Otherwise, they would get, slaves would count for nothing, and it wouldn't count towards the population because they're property, they're not people in the minds of many Southerners, okay? Um, so that's the three-fifths compromise. Uh, and, of course, if you're going to do that for the South, you have to do something for the North. So um, they come up also with the slave trade compromise. The slave trade compromise basically says that will continue the African slave trade. It's important to note, African slave trade. Mean, meaning, um, we will continue to import slaves from Africa. Slaves will continue to come from Africa or the Caribbean or wherever. Um, will continue for another 20 years. Okay, so, you're, so we will allow the slave trade to continue for 20 years, the African slave trade to continue for 20 years. So that means until the year 1808. In other words, when 1808 rolls around, no more boats of slaves coming here from Africa. It's important to note that is not saying that's when the slave trade will end completely. Okay, we can still trade slaves within the United States, but you just can't, we're just not going to bring any more in from Africa. So they gave a, a 20 year. Um, addendum to allow the slave trade to continue, um, which appeases uh, which appeases the people in the north because they want to see it come to an end. Um, and to appease the people in the south, they also come up with a provision that says that uh, um, that you're not allowed to um, <clears throat> uh, aid uh, slaves from escaping. So, uh, also says that people are not allowed to aid escaped slaves. In other words, if you're from Pennsylvania and a slave comes over from Maryland, you can't kind of help them get into a non-slave state and get their freedom. Okay, so we're seeing compromises here, compromises that are going to create problems in the long term. This one will be revisited. This one will exist uh, for quite some time, and uh, you know, be in, in these ultimately. Um, are two of the early decisions that ultimately lead us to civil war. Now, the civil war is still 75 years away, but we're already seeing the seeds been sown of the differences between North and South, and these compromises are two of the very early actions that happen that lead us towards civil war. So the next piece, of course, is the creation of the Constitution. Now, we recognize the problems with the Articles of Confederation that we need to have a stronger system, a stronger national government, okay? And we need to also protect against our system of government becoming something like a monarchy uh, system like that. So one thing that we grant is popular sovereignty. Um, Basically, that uh, people in, in, in their states have a right to, to vote uh, freely and, and make determinations for their state as long as those things don't violate the Constitution. Um, they protect the vote at first. These are the people that can vote. Landowning, white, males. So as long as you are a male, you are white, and you own land, you have the right to vote. And that is guaranteed in the Constitution at first. Remember, there will be other amendments later on that change who can vote, like African Americans or women uh, or the voting age and stuff like that. But popular sovereignty is guaranteed to all um, white male landowners. We also create a system of checks and balances meaning that there's no one house of the government that has too much power over the other. We understand checks and balances. Uh, the judicial system has checks over the executive and legislative. They have checks over the judicial system. And um, same thing with executive and legislative. Okay, so that is what 
the concept of checks and balances means, meaning no part of the government can become too powerful. We're talking about the ability to veto laws. We're talking about the ability to override vetoes. Uh, the last thing we want in this country, more than anything else, is for America to become a more like a monarchy or a dictatorship. We fought a revolutionary war to prevent that. Uh, so for America to kind of fall into this concept of having somebody in charge like a president or whatever that is so powerful would kind of go against the entire ideal of the American Revolution. All right, so let's talk a little bit then about coming to the Constitution, right? Uh, so you have two separate groups here. You have the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Uh, the Federalists are the folks that support the Constitution. Oops, sorry about that. Federalists are support the, the folks that support the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists are the ones that are against the Constitution, okay? Um, so you got to find a way to agree here. We've made some compromises in the past. We have to do some things now to protect uh, this new idea of America for the future. Federalists support essentially the breakdown between the two sides. Are federalists support a strong federal government, hence the term federalists. Anti-federalists are more uh, supporting like uh, the state powers, more like the Articles of Confederation. So they support um, kind of stronger state governments. The next task for our government is going to be to establish uh, or to get the people to support uh, the idea of the Constitution, right? And that's where the Federalist Papers come in, right? Uh, again, we're talking about colonial readers and the important role that they play in making things happen. We know that the colonists love to read, okay? So these colonial readers are going to read about uh, various concepts of this, this new government and ultimately will decide for themselves how much uh, or if they support it. Now, the Federalist Papers are primarily written by three Federalist leaders, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. So Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. And they, write, um, and they write all of these essays that are part of the Federalist Papers under the name Publius. So it's kind of written under a pseudonym, a fake name. Uh, and there's about, oh God, there's around 80 or so essays. Um, but three of them in particular are of particular, are, are, are of importance to us here. That's Federalist number 10, Federalist number 51, and Federalist number 70. Federalist number 10 talks about the dangers of political factions, why factioning is going to be bad for the survival of our country, uh, and we need to avoid this at all costs. Factions are the same thing as like political parties, right? The Constitution does not necessitate the existence of any political party, all right? And we're already seeing them develop parties or factions develop a little bit here with the Federalists. Uh, and the anti-federalists. So we're already starting to faction a little bit. Really, the Republicans and Democrats and other parties, those are factions, okay? And Madison warns us against the dangers of this, all right? Uh, Federalist number 51, written by James Madison, also uh, talks about the importance of checks and balances or separation of powers and, and why that's going to be really important for the success of our country why we need to have um, a powerful executive as well as a powerful legislative branch and a powerful judiciary so that no one group has so much power that they can become a dictator or become more of like a monarchy or a king or queen or something like that, right? So uh, it kind of tells us about why we need to have this separation of powers. And then finally, Federalist 70, written by Alexander Hamilton, talks about uh, the need for a strong executive, why our country needs a strong leader uh, to handle certain things that were not handled well in the, uh, under the Articles of Confederation, things that ultimately led to events like uh, a Shays' Rebellion and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, these three 
10, 51, and 70 are particularly important, and they tell us a lot uh, about uh, what colonial readers are pushing towards, or what uh, what these leaders are, are pushing towards. Then we have the creation of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was required uh, in order to sign the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists said, we want a Bill of Rights that protects the rights of individuals and states. Okay? Um, we want to protect the rights of individuals and states uh, from, you know, the tyranny of a too powerful national executive. That is the argument made by the Anti-Federalist leaders. Uh, the leader of the Anti-Federalists is basically Thomas Jefferson, while these guys here are kind of the leaders of the Federalist Party. Uh, <clears throat> and if you look at the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Bill of Rights, uh, really kind of talk about protections of rights that are guaranteed for individuals, right? The five freedoms in the First Amendment, speech, petition, assembly, um, freedom of religion and freedom of the press, uh, the right to bear arms, quartering of soldiers, uh, protection from illegal search and seizure, the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment due process or uh, the double jeopardy clause, the Sixth Amendment, uh, right to a speedy trial by jury, Seventh Amendment, right to civil suits of no uh, less than $20, uh, A, protection from cruel and unusual punishment, um, nine, laws cannot restrict other rights. All of these are rights that guarantee certain rights and things to individuals to protect us from tyranny of governmental leadership, right? And the ninth, which again is not, uh, laws cannot restrict other rights, and tenth is powers granted to the states are states are, are rights that are reserved to protect the rights of the states. Only with these rights added to the Constitution through the first ten amendments, through the Bill of Rights, will the Anti-Federalists support and sign off on the Constitution. They get their rights, we get, uh, they get their Bill of Rights, we get our, con or, uh, the Federals get their Constitution, and our new system of government is born. Okay? Um, all right, I think that's all for today. Uh, I'll have another one probably for you tomorrow. We'll plan on a packet and quiz being Thursday. Um, tentatively, it may be Friday. Uh, that's for Chapter 6. And uh, that's about it. All right, talk to you later.